So the first type of network we'll discuss are the protein-protein interaction networks. So the first type of interaction network we'll talk about are the protein-protein interaction networks, or the so-called PPI networks. And so again, a PPI network is basically a network in which nodes represent protein domains or individual proteins, and edges indicate some kind of physical interaction. And so it's one important thing to note is that uh, when a pair of proteins interact, they don't necessarily have to be different protein domains. And so you can form, for example, uh, what are called like dimers or tetramers, in which uh, in a dimer, for example, you can have what's called a homodimer, where you have two domains that are identical, that are interacting with each other. Or you can have, for example, a heterodimer, which means that you have two domains interacting, but they're from their different protein domains. And the same goes for tetramers, where you have four domains interacting. You can either have a homo tetramer, where you have four identical domains interacting, or a hetero tetramer, where you have four or at least two different uh, domains interacting at the same time. And so uh, part B of this diagram basically illustrates a plausible interaction network between the domains shown in a part A. And the thing to note here is that, again, there's one node for every domain uh, in this figure, and an edge, a solid edge, corresponds to a direct physical physical interaction between two domains. What you'll also notice in part B is that some of these edges are dashed. And what a dashed line represents is that uh, in the assays that measure protein-protein interactions that we'll talk about in a second, uh, sometimes you can have two domains that your assay claims are physically interacting, but actually what's happening is that they're in indirect contact. Right, and so in, in this case, for example, SUMO3 has a dashed line to PEX10, and that's because SUMO3 doesn't actually directly physically contact PEX10. SUMO3 is in direct contact uh, with UB21, and UB21 is in direct contact with PEX10. And so this kind of, uh, these dashed lines represent indirect interactions, and those can also be pulled down by PPI assays. So the most classic kind of protein-protein interaction assay is the yeast-2 hybrid. And so the idea of the yeast-2 hybrid is that um, if you look at a lot of different transcription factors, many transcription factors, DNA-binding ones anyways, have at least two domains, one of which is responsible for the actual recognition of DNA and binding to it. So that's the DNA-binding domain. And then there's also the activation domain, which is responsible for interacting with for example, transcription machinery or coactivators and other transcription factors uh, to basically actually uh, facilitate changing of gene expression once DNA is bound. And so in the yeast 2 hybrid assay, basically the idea is that you can take uh, different transcription factors and you can basically separate the DNA binding domain from the activation domain. And so suppose that you are interested in assessing whether two different protein domains interact. So we'll call those uh, domains the bait and the target. Um, in the context of this lecture, it doesn't really matter which of the two proteins you, uh, you want to define as the bait or the target. Um, but suppose that you've decided ahead of time which interactor you want to call the bait and which you want to call the target. The idea is that you can create two different fusion proteins, one in which you fuse the bait protein to the DNA binding domain, and the other in which you fuse the target to the activation domain. And so now the idea is that um, the only way in which you can have, uh, the only way to recapitulate the activity of the original transcription factor in which the DNA binding domain uh, interacts with the activation domain to activate gene expression is if the bait and the target both interact at the same time. Because if the bait and target interact at the same time, then the DNA binding domain basically tethers the bait target complex to the, for example, the promoter region or the enhancer. And once it's tethered there, because the target is fused to the activation domain, 
then the activation domain is free to activate gene expression. Um, if the bait and the target uh, don't uh, interact, then there's nothing really to keep the activation domain close uh, to the binding site in order to activate expression. And so in theory, gene expression will only get activated if the bait physically interacts with the target uh, to then recruit RNA polymerase and then basically express some kind of selectable marker. So when you run a yeast to hybrid assay, you typically want to assay all possible physical interactions between, say, all protein coding genes in a genome. And so to do this efficiently, for every protein that you want to assay its physical interactions with, you want to generate, uh, you want to construct two different plasmids, one in which your protein of interest is fused to the DNA binding domain of, it, of a particular transcription factor, and one plasmid in which that protein domain is fused to the activation domain of a TF. And so the idea is that each one of these plasmids needs to encode some kind of selectable marker. In this case, I'm giving you an example of uh, a gene that is part of the uh, tryptophan uh, biosynthesis pathway for the DNA binding domain fusion, and a gene that's involved in leucine biosynthesis uh, for the plasmid that uh, contains the fusion with the activation domain. And so the idea here is that you can take these two plasmids and you can transfect them into, for example, a yeast cell, and then you can detect for successful uh, double transfections by basically selecting for cells that can grow in the absence of both tryptophan and leucine. And so it's worth pointing out that although yeast 2 hybrid was originally uh, invented uh, with respect, in, invented in the context of transfecting yeast cells, people can successfully do yeast 2 hybrid in other, for example, mammalian cell types as well. And so if you're trying to perform a yeast 2 hybrid on a genome wide scale, then essentially what you typically need to do is uh, take like a very large plate or set of plates and construct your bait and target libraries covering all of the proteins in the genome. And then basically you test every possible pairwise interaction. So every protein gets to act as a bait against every other protein uh, in the genome and also acts as a prey for every other protein in the genome. And so the end result of a yeast to hybrid screen is you essentially get um, like a giant table or a giant matrix where the rows and the columns represent different proteins uh, that you've assayed in the yeast to hybrid screen. And the and basically this matrix tells you whether or not there's an interaction that was found between any possible pair of proteins in your genome. And so oftentimes these graphs are visualized as, or these yeast to hybrid screen results are visualized as graphs, where nodes represent the different proteins that you've assayed and edges in, represent interactions that your yeast to hybrid screen is, uh, has identified through the bait prey interactions. And so yeast to hybrid screens and protein-protein interaction screens in general are famous for generating what's known as the hairball diagrams. Uh, and so here I'm showing you an example uh, of a yeast to hybrid screen in, in yeast. And you can basically see that it's at a very high level. It's, it's very hard to discern anything useful from this because it essentially looks like a hairball. Um, and so later on in this lecture, when we talk about uh, looking at the structure of networks and trying to identify important genes and communities and things like this, um, that's when we'll really kind of discuss what do you do with these hairballs once you once you generate them. And so one point that I really want to uh, make here is that yeast protein protein interaction networks, um, in particular those uh, generated from these two hybrid screens, are extremely noisy and they're extremely hard to reproduce. And so people have done many um, reproducibility studies where uh, 
they've tried to uh, have two different labs, for example, run these two hybrid screens on the same cells, uh, measure protein-protein interactions across the genome, and then check to see how much overlap there is between the two different assays. And so um, back in 2002, um, when these screens were just starting to really be applied genome-wide, uh, people are finding that, for example, out of like 80,000 interactions that you might detect in a given assay, only like two and two and a half K might be reported by more than one approach. And so these numbers back from 2002 are a little bit old because they're people um, don't run these kind of comparisons too, too often. Um, but generally speaking, even today, reproducibility is, is a huge problem for yeast 2 hybrid screens and protein protein interaction networks in general. Um, and so, you know, an obvious question then becomes, well, why, why are these interactions so difficult to reproduce? Is the, is the assay just terrible or, um, you know, are there other biological reasons for the high degree of variability? And so in terms of what kinds of, uh, errors or, uh, problems with the assay can arise in a given yeast 2 hybrid screen. Uh, there's a number of problems that can arise. So here, for example, uh, we'll talk a little bit about what causes false negatives. And so a false negative interaction is when the yeast 2 hybrid screen tells you that protein A and protein B do not interact, but whereas protein A and B actually do interact in the cell. The assay just didn't detect that interaction. And so there's a number of reasons why you might have false negatives in your screen. <clears throat> the first of which is, well, uh, oftentimes, uh, you might not even have the protein, the, the target protein in your library. And so what that means is that, um, sometimes it's, it's not easy, especially for newer genomes that are uncharacterized. It may not be easy to actually identify the set of all proteins that are uh, being translated in the cell. Um, and so your first problem may be, well, you just didn't know that the protein was there. The second problem is that you, your protein may not be able to fold properly or may not have, for example, the necessary like coactivators or other uh, protein domains that are necessary for that protein to fold properly. Um, and so what I mean by that is that some protein domains, for example, they will change conformation upon binding to other uh, domains that are available. And so if protein A, need, if you're testing the interaction between protein A and B, and say protein A needs protein C present in order to fold properly to facilitate the interaction between A and B, then you're not going to detect this interaction in your screen because the yeast 2 hybrid screen as it is presented here in this lecture only tests for pairs of interactions. And so it's worth pointing out that people have extended the yeast 2 hybrid screen to test for say like three-way interactions, but it's extremely expensive and hard to do those kinds of yeast 2 hybrid screens. Um, another situation in which, in which this can arise is because um, oftentimes you say, for example, you might want to test for physical interactions between human proteins, but you, for whatever reason, you don't want to use uh, human cells in your assay. You suppose you still want to use yeast cells. And so if you're expressing, for example, human proteins in yeast cells, then the environment of the yeast cells may not be conducive for your proteins to fold in an optimal way. Um, finally, it's worth also noting that sometimes proteins, uh, you know, along the same lines as I just mentioned, sometimes proteins need, they can need other domains uh, present in order to fold properly. And so you have like missing cofactors. You can also have the opposite problem in which um, proteins might interact in a weird way with the bait by forming, for example, multimers, or they may even interact with, um, like your bait prey may interact with uh, your DNA binding domain in, a, uh, in an unanticipated way, or your prey protein may interact with your activation domain to change how it folds. So in addition to false negative interactions, you can also have false positive interactions in your yeast 2 hybrid screen. So for example, uh, certain proteins can be highly, for example, disordered. 
And so certain proteins may, for example, be tend to be sticky and they may tend to interact with many other protein domains um, just because some proteins are highly flexible. And so they can, you know, they can adapt and bind to many different other proteins uh, in a kind of non-specific way. And so basically the problem then you have is that your yeast to hybrid screen may tell you that you know, protein A, which is say disordered, may be sticky and may interact with many other potential proteins. But part, part of the problem here is that you may not actually see a lot of these non-specific interactions in practice because in a real cell in vivo, uh, two proteins can only interact if they're actually expressed and present in the cell at the same time. And so basically the cell can use gene regulation in order to control which proteins are essentially uh, present in the cell at the same time. And in that way, certain interactions which could potentially happen never do actually happen in vivo. Um, and so in, the, in a similar way, um, interactions between proteins uh, can also be inhibited in vivo by the presence of other proteins as well. And so basically the point here is that um, in a yeast to hybrid screen, you're really only testing interactions between a pair of proteins in isolation, and you don't have all of the other proteins that are typically present. Um, and that can in turn affect um, whether or not binding is, you know, actually happens in the cell or not. Um, and so this, this kind of problem draws a lot of parallels to um, lecture on TFDNA recognition where we talked about how position weight matrices can be used to scan the genome and identify binding sites of transcriptor factors and I said that in that lecture I basically said that one of the big challenges of PWMs is that they do predict in vitro binding uh, reasonably well but they're poor at predicting in vivo binding and it's in essence the same a similar problem in the sense that PWMs predict the potential for binding but whether binding actually happens or not in vivo depends on a lot of other factors that are also present.